Welcome to the podcast where together, every Monday, we explore hospitality in its very broader sense. From culture and cooking, cocktails and coffee, nutrition and farming, politics and animal welfare, organic and sustainability, family and business, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. Come and learn with me, Mark Cribb, about where our food and our drink comes from and the businesses, and more importantly, the human beings that thrive on where we decide to spend our time and our money. Sign up to our weekly newsletter at humansofhospitality.co.uk and hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. There is no getting away from the fact that this week's guest, James Cochran, is a dude. He's the chef with no name, just like Prince, and his restaurant is named after a song from The Strokes. And if that's not cool enough, he also happens to be an epic chef and an all-round entertaining chap. If you look at James's sample menus, from pheasant sausage to buttermilk jerk spiced chicken, you can see the influences that shape his brilliant cooking. Scottish from his dad and Vincentian from his mum. And that's in the Caribbean for those not in the know. And I've been there and it's a little piece of heaven on earth. Now, when James was honing his chef skills alongside Brett Graham at the famous The Ledbury, he couldn't bring these influences to the fore. Great though his time with the Michelin starred chef was. And he really does mean great, despite the 18 hour days when he never saw daylight and despite regularly missing his tube stop because he was so exhausted. James came into his own when he was named Champion of Champions on the Great British Menu in 2018, and his goat sharing board and legendary Scotch bonnet jam reached the attention of millions. Now, as the owner of 1251, he has the freedom to work creatively with the ingredients from his childhood. He says he feels honest every day about the food he does and is happy to carry on his parents' legacy. I very much hope you enjoy this week's conversation. James Cochran, thank you so much for agreeing to be uh, on the podcast today. Hugely no appreciate it. For people listening, can you just explain where on planet Earth are we, please, James? Um, so we are in North London. The restaurant's called 1251, named after the Stroke song. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit more. We probably will. I actually played it last night when I was doing my research. Okay, I, uh, okay, I asked cool. Alexa to play it while I was doing it. I said, like, ah, yeah, great tune. It was a drunken night, and I was at my business partner's a restaurant down the road here, actually, on Upper Street, called um, The Steam Passage. And... Um, Basically, I used to do pop-ups called Campbell Love with my four best mates. Right. I lived in Campbell Green, and we did like north, south, east, west. So it was kind of the, really the kind of beginning of when pop-up scene was around about 10, maybe 12 years ago. And um, and anyway, I've been to basically own a Young's pub up there. So like it was alabing.com basically there. And I kind of did a five-course taste on New Year's Eve. And we kind of got drunk. And it was like, we, I'd never seen food like this before. And he was like, I've got some few things to do, and I still had to kind of really understand my style of cooking and where I was going direction-wise. We like, should go to business again. I was like, yeah. And then basically, like, as soon as we hugged 12 straight scale, we well, should go to 12 Really? Just so like that? So we decided to go to 12 So going back to it again, Russell's called 1251, Upper Street Angel, N11QN. Um, Ridgie from Whitstable in Kent, a kind of Michelin star trained. My background of food is really stemmed from my roots. So I'm half Scottish, half Incension. I'm from Whitstable, so I try to bring all the influences in. Small plates kind of vibe. That's a, that's and a... accessible and affordable and non-pretentious. It is. I checked out your menu last night. Yeah. Very affordable, actually. Yeah, so, yeah we. No. Um, I worked in um, the Ledbury and a couple of Michelin star restaurants called the Harwood Arms. You can't give all the answers straight away in the first question. Uh, I, yeah, okay, I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> but before we do, um, it was lucky that when you had that hug, it was a cool song. What would have you done if it was like, you know, the Spice Girls or something like that? Okay, uh, well, tune, this could have <laughs> been, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, been a very different... Yeah. Could have been a bit, because 1251 well, kind of sounds cool. Yeah, it, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's good. And if you turn yeah. the 12 back, because upside down, it's 51. So 12 nice. is this entity here. And 51 means we kind of do other things off the back of that. Yeah, and it works because I've seen some of the apparel and the shirts and stuff you've got, and it looks nice. Yeah. It looks like a cool brand, doesn't it? Yeah, so I don't, I don't think that would work quite so well uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. With, with, with other tunes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I've mentioned to a couple of people that I'm coming up to see you today, and, and there's two things you're probably uh, most famous for. One was the Great British Menu, and the other one was the fact that somebody, um, shall we say, trademarked your name, who isn't you. Uh, I'm going to come back to the second one, but we'll start, if you don't mind, just Great British Menu. You, you mentioned just then you've got this really quite uh, diverse and eclectic uh, background and influences. Yeah. What were the dishes on the Great British Menu that stood out? Because they kind of represented you pretty well. Um, well... 
Pro British Menu, I mean, it was to do with NHS. So for me, it was a great connection. My mum had passed away. My mum kind of paved the way for me to kind of, for me to be a chef. And she found it very integral for me to understand my heritage and my roots. So we go to Brixton um, at a very early age. So going back to Great British Menu, it was kind of my mum kind of of her kind of introducing me to food at the beginning and paving the way and making sure that I could represent when we had like the um, under knife, the goat sharing or the coconut dish. And um, every single kind of link was really to represent my mum and the journey of that. And uh, well, it turned out pretty all right. It so. did turn out all right. Yeah, you did, you, you did <laughs> right. Your mum would have been unknown. You did. It's a great British menu. And, um, and I think it's just a great platform for chefs to kind of grow and build. I think if you look at people like Tom Kerridge has kind of gone there, looking and blossomed very well on that. Jason Atherton, Marcus Wareham, they're all amazing chefs and they've yeah. kind of just gone further and further. So it's been a great platform for people to kind of understand yeah. more Ma- about Ma- myself. Michael Bremner, do you know Michael Bremner? I'm sure he was Scottish Yes, menu. yeah, yeah, Scottish guy, I've, yeah. I've interviewed Michael, so he's yeah. been on the podcast. So yeah, yeah good, cool, good, cool. good chap as well. So it's been a good platform for me to kind of grow and uh, I give praise and thanks to Great British Menu, but never do it again. Yeah. because of the stresses of filming. Yeah, he said the same. And plus I've won it all as well. Not to, Actually, not to blow my own trumpet, yeah, but yeah. I think he did do it twice because he didn't win the first time, so that motivated him. Yeah, so he yeah. did go back and uh, win it, so maybe it would have been different if you had But not only did you win, you're champion of champions. Yeah, were, I know, so, yeah, uh, I know. So congratulations. I think it's the first year ever happened, yeah. Yeah. No, so I yeah, think, like... I think you're right. Can't complain. Um, one of the things you uh, you did on there was a goat dish, but it was a bit different in the fact that you used lots of different sort of cuts of the yeah. goat, I suppose. Is that something that sort of came, again, you know, working with your mum? I said working, you're cooking with your mum. Was that something that yeah. she believed in? And is that something that you reflect here as well? Yeah, I think, yeah, if you see that kind of connection, if you look at goat, you think of curried goat, obviously. You think of the West Indies. I remember when I used to go to St Vincent when I was a very young age, and um, we would go to, like, down the shanty towns, and every Friday would be, like, the culture part where... People would, of course, got the goat, slaughtered it, hung it, and then they would cook it in a big pot. And the whole kind of village and the whole kind of people would come together and it'd be like a great celebration, lots of rum. But again, I was too young to drink rum back then. So I think it was that was a standard and integral moment of my life that I remember a lot of goats. So I worked with a company called James Cabrito and we put goat on here and it's uh, sustainable meat. And if you look at sustainability at the moment, us using up all of this, all our meats and stuff, things like that. I think it's uh, it's a byproduct because we're killing the goats for its milk, and we have a beautiful product that's grown in the UK, and we should be using it more and I more. Think, so I've done a podcast with James actually. So he's, he's uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a whole episode all about it. Fascinating. He knows. His oh my goat. god! It's Jesus unbelievable. Christ, he knows yeah. his goat, didn't yeah. he? And I had absolutely no idea. I can't, I can't remember the statistics now off my head. I'll have to go back and listen. But yeah, well, it, it's just a waste, isn't it? So many billy goats are shot at birth fundamentally. Yeah. He tells the story that, you know, put your hand up if you eat goat's cheese, and most people in the room do. Put your hand up if you eat goat's meat, and very few people do, and that's the problem. Half the goats born are billy goats, and, and they go to waste. So, yeah, exactly. uh, yeah, no, it's a great product so, to um, use. So, I showcased on the Great British Menu, I showcased on Saturday Kitchen, and I think it's an integral dish to kind of put on the menu and showcase, and we kind of bring those kind of colourful kind of spices and flavours to the dish, and... Um, the feedback so far from it all has been very positive. We did a small little pop-up in a box park, uh, showcasing goat, gone very well, but we need to kind of do it in London. So we did it in Croydon. We think about if you want to get a buzz, for me, it needs to be in London to kind of get that. If you look at the population in London, the amount of diversity, and goat, you think, is the third most eaten meat in the world, I believe. Really? Wow. Yeah, so... Well, that's one fact I don't think James gave me, so you've trumped him there. Yeah, the... <laughs> so I think we need to kind of open up people's minds, but it's going to be a, a very slow burner because if you put a chicken restaurant, a burger restaurant, a goat restaurant, put 100 people in front of it, you, go, you know where they're going to go. Yeah. So it's going to be a slow burner, but I... I it's something that's very close to my heart and I want to work with James Cabrito. We've been to Trinidad with it and just kind of get out more and more. But because when people kind of see on Great British Menu, they've come here and they've absolutely loved it, adored it. Yeah. 
So um, yeah, no, it's a great platform. We yeah. uh, off the back of chatting to James, put it on our menu as well in, in my restaurant, and uh, yeah, really popular. So uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, which is good because uh, anything yeah. that can help with sustainability and local, yeah, ethics, exactly. Um, I think is good. I was listening to you on uh, Yes Chef, the other podcast, uh, a few weeks ago. I don't know when you did it, but I listened a couple of weeks ago. Um, and there was another dish that you mentioned, uh, sort of the influence of roast dinners with your mum, and there was some sort of like uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, it fragrant was, lamb. It sounded it, it, awesome, it, even though it was a bit it weird. Was, I was, it was like, it, what, absolutely, <laughs> mish, it was absolute mishmash. It was. Uh, it was like roast my favourite meal of all time. Yeah. I think it's just that you know, Sunday feeling of all your family kind of coming together. Hospitality. You know they're people. working every every day of the week with your parents are and brings everyone together. And um it was an absolute mishmash of flavours. So we'd have like a jerk spiced with scotch bonnet jam, rub on a lamb leg with suet pudding to breadfruit to plantain to roast potatoes to Catalu- yeah, it was just a odd mishmash that I think I was a bit naive to because I, I just <laughs> I just accepted it and and it was at the time it know, was, was lovely and then yeah. you kind of you get older and <laughs> as you become a chef you're like well that was <laughs> doesn't work well it doesn't work well but again it was just my mum kind of really kind of understanding that these flavours are from your roots and induce it from early age and. So, um, yeah. And it kind of paved the way for my style of cooking now, really. Did your dad cook as well or just your mum? Just my mum. My yeah. dad was uh, my dad was born in the end of World War II, so I think it's very old school, kind of like the father goes out of work, mum stays at home. But my dad could not cook really? at all. I think he did a stir fry once, and I think it had all the stir fry components where you've got chopped noodles in for two minutes, all the veg was cut, the chicken was cut and marinated. I think it ended up taking two hours to do it to figure it out <laughs> and it was not well it wasn't memorable let's say that yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, yeah. lucky your mum was some influence yeah. so um so how old were you when you started cooking and, and at what point did you realize that you wanted to be a, a chef um so my um my parents decided to send me to like a nunnery mm. uh, that was one of my questions why, why was that <laughs> what, what was there i wish i could ask them the questions now unfortunately <laughs> but very yes uh how long were you there <laughs> Too long. <laughs> it was an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, from the age of five to eleven. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah, very strange because my dad's not religious at all. Yeah, it was very strange. My mum is kind of religious, but um, my dad had a very bad kind of upbringing of education. So I think for some reason, same way to nunnery, be very strict. My dad really wanted me to be like a lawyer, a barrister. That was his kind of like goal, and really pushed me into early age, like from age like seven, eight, like head down, this is what you're going to do. But I used to cook a lot with my mum, so when the bananas would go rotten, we'd turn into banana bread. And I used to cook a lot with my mum, and my mum was like, stop putting so much pressure on James. She'd like, whatever you want to do, we'll be happy with. And I was like, I want to be a chef. I want to cook. So from the age of eight years old, I knew I wanted to be a chef. Wow. What was their reaction? Or your dad's, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> your your mum sounds like she was happy. Um, <laughs> is that when he pulled you out of the nunnery well, school? Well, like, <laughs> well this is the nunnery closed down, actually. That was a bit luck. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess in a day, whatever your kids, whatever makes your kids happy is the most important thing. And um, I was very keen to really get my head down. So I think from the age of, from an early age, I was kind of cooking for my parents. And then I started my first job, I think, when I was 12, 13. Wow. Two pound an hour. Yeah. 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 I worked at a restaurant called Wheeler's Oyster Bar. Yeah. In Whitstable, that's... Um, it's a it's a very uh, famous restaurant, really. It's kind of an institution. It's been there since 1856, um, and I class as my second mum. Really, she's a former gypsy. Well, she's a gypsy basically, and uh, this is really, Delia, re- is it? Delia, yeah, yeah. Really looks after you. Looks after me. Really, kind of put on a straight and narrow. Teenage kids always run off the rails, basically, and, uh, and I still go back there, like still now and it's still some of the same faces that were there she must be proud to see 20, what you've done yeah yeah like I went and worked there before I opened here and I was living down on the beach hut in Whitstable for a bit waking up looking at the oyster beds it was absolutely beautiful and you know going working there and it was just one big family and every time I go back down there it's just lovely and they're, yeah they're super proud and they always ring me up I always get, take ideas off him take ideas off me Amazing. and it's just a, a beautiful relationship that 
I have with Delia and have with yeah. Mark. So it must be great if you went there when you were twelve, because I think you know one of the most exciting things in hospitality is seeing your sort of team progress and stuff. Yeah. So, so to take somebody on at that yeah. age and then see them win Great British Menu yeah, on the exactly. telly, that must have been pretty and exciting. At, when I was at college, we did um, we did a seafood competition. I won that with my old head chef. So they've been great supports for four eight three and um, plans to do a pop up actually there in the summertime. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we do well. back to back and. Uh, yeah, I, just, I can't. I, I'm Whitstable so close to my heart. I, I don't mean, know Whitstable, so why is it so special to you? It's, um, uh, it's just a, a beautiful part of the world. Um, it's famous for its oysters, uh, beautiful beaches, very kind of bohemian kind of vibe to it as well. Um, the oyster festival is lovely. It's just a very quaint seaside town, and, and uh, I'm just very lucky that I was brought up there because. A lot of people who know Whitsmore quite well would always praise it very high. And you have beautiful seafood, lovely restaurants, lovely pubs all along the beach, and it's just a, a wonderful place. No, it sounds to great. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna. I was looking at some photos last night when I heard, was, you know, doing some research, and I thought, yeah, why have I never been? It's odd. It's not exactly that far away. I'm Bournemouth boy. I, I'm, yeah, I live okay. by the beach, so I'm quite lucky. Yeah. But um, yeah, I need to go and need to go and check it out. Oyster Festival, if you do. Yeah, when's that? Uh, that is around July time, and it's I think like a hundred thousand people descend. Wow, really? Onto Whitstable. If you like your oysters, and you like. Whitstable, so Whitstable Bay Ale, and it's just some good craft beers. It's just a good atmosphere. Everyone's drinking, having a good time, drinking oysters, Morris dancing. Wow, it's good fun. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. I'm definitely, uh, definitely going to check yeah, it out. Yeah. So you went in there at twelve. How old were you when you left? Uh, I left there just after college when I was eighteen years okay. old. So you'd gone in, presumably, what doing a bit of washing uh, pot, up or something? Pot wash. And, yeah, and then came out chefing. Yeah, I'm presuming, pot wash, and I uh, bit of wait, wait, waitering, and um, then I kind of like did a bit of filleting fish, a little bit of salad prep, and just kind of progressed more and more there. I think it was like 17, 18, I was doing all the hot main courses on there. Wow. So yeah, it was great because you, you you had people who were fishing on the beach coming up with fresh fish and you're cutting, mm. you're skinning skate wings that have come out the sea after like 10 minutes and they're flapping away. As you know, Bournemouth, like the amount of fresh fish you have around there. And um, and it was just like an eye opener. Mm. And um, and yeah, just it was it was so, just it was it was a lovely time to be there. Yeah, amazing. And so, I kind of left there and um, went to work to a restaurant called uh, Reeds in Faversham, um, and did from like eighteen to twenty or eighteen to twenty-one there, uh, and left there and thought I was like the dog's bollocks basically. I thought I was like yeah like yeah I'm pretty good. And came to London, just got destroyed basically. Yeah, the big change. So I, I interviewed um, Steve Groves from Rue at Parliament Square. I don't know if you know him, yeah, but okay. um, recently. And uh, I actually knew him when he lived down in Bournemouth. So he was a head chef of a, of a beachfront restaurant in Bournemouth for a number of years. He too decided to go to London and literally had to go back in as a commie for sort of, you know, spend two years back back in the hard graft, getting his ass kicked and getting shouted yeah. at. Was it the same for you? Was it a kind uh, of start from scratch or did you uh, come into a, a, a sort of a, a higher position in London? Well, I went to... Lib I went to I went to the square first, right. had a trial there. There was no jobs. So I was looking at a good food guide. Saw Lebry popped up, the Brit worked there. So went and had a trial at Lebry. Went there, trial on Friday. Had nowhere to live. Somehow got a flat on the weekend. Started on the Monday. Um, and went there to chef the party, actually. Oh, did you? Oh, you did well. You, so didn't, have, you didn't have to go back to scratch. I didn't have comedy. I won't tell Steve. Steve. Yeah. No, comedy <laughs> there. They just had, you basically did run your own section, and uh, it was the best years of my life. You stayed like, a long time, didn't you? I was so there for clearly, five years, yeah, I think. That, that clearly worked. I mean, yeah, it was. <laughs> I still have nightmares from it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like it, 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 it laid some really great foundations for some of the styles of food that I do now, and um, and yeah, and it was the best years of my life. I mean, it, it, we went from one star to rising two to two star. Everyone was just fighting against Brett. It was just a good atmosphere. Long, long hours, 18 hour days, sometimes doing 10, 12, 30 days a week. And I left there really because I didn't know myself anymore because I was just so mentally and physically drained. Yeah, I bet. And, yeah, that's um, a long time to do that sort yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it was- Not see the light. And it was nonstop. And do you know what I mean? You would arrive there at like, in winter time, you arrive there at like seven o'clock in the morning and leave at like one o'clock in the morning, so you never see daylight. No, incredible. I remember walking yeah. past and the sun blinding in, it'd be blinding my eyes, it's like, 
this is mental because yeah. you think about it, people go and eat all the time. They don't think about the chefs in the kitchen, about what they're doing, about the hours they're doing, about the yeah. amount of pressure when they come in. It's just because eating out is such an enjoyable occasion. People don't think about that. I don't want them to either. Well, no, but it's the point of this podcast, basically. It was, it's called The Humans of Hospitality for yeah. that reason. It's not about the brands. It's not about the restaurant. It's about, you know, the kind of the lives that go on and the yeah. human beings. Because you see so many people in this industry putting, you know, utter, utter dedication and devotion into whatever their thing is. I was um, interviewing Jody Schechter last week from Laverstoke Farm down in, um, in okay. the countryside. He was an ex-Formula One. Um, champion, but his his obsession, and I, and I just love finding people who obsess about their thing. And and he uh, was obsessed about soil. So the fact that everything we eat, fund unless it comes from the sea, fundamentally it comes from the soil. Whether it's the animals they're eating the soil, he makes mozzarella predominantly. Yeah, okay. And uh, he was so obsessed by trying to get the soil perfect that he employed a biologist and a chemist for eight years to research, you know, the makeup of the soil and how to affect it and how to affect what his buffalo were eating. I think he ended up with thirty one different kind of herbs and stuff that they were eating wow. to create the best mozzarella. Is it beautiful, is it? It's stunning, yeah, yeah, really good, yeah, as you know, but, but better than the Italian, so he'd um, have us believe. Really good, actually, check it out, Lever yeah, okay. is, um, yeah, good, good quality, aimed, aimed um, uh, you know, in the restaurant sector. Amazing. Um, but, but what amazes me is that, yeah, there's people like that behind the scenes of hospitality that your average Joe going out for dinner has got no idea that chefs are working 18 hours a day yeah. for 13 hours, and they've got no idea that it takes a biologist and a chemist to perfect the soil for the buffalo yeah. to eat to create the mozzarella. And that's, that's why I love coming out and telling yeah. these stories, because I want people to not go into the harvester and to go into a beautiful, beautiful restaurant yeah, where exactly. all of this love is exactly. behind the scenes. Sorry, I mean, harvester, don't sue me. We would be, there's blood, sweat and tears that we put into every single, well, that, every chef should put into every single plate that they do. Definitely. And you have sleepless nights when you're contemplating about, is this good enough? Is that good enough? There's, there's not a moment, as you know, having your own business where you switch off. 100%. And you have to kind of understand, when I first opened this place, when it was like, now this is mine, I had very lot of sleepless nights. And I kind of came to terms with that in some kind of ways. That's not the right way to be. But you have to come to terms that you're never ever gonna switch off in your restaurant. And when you kind of get to that stage and you can kind of become more happiness in yourself, some kind of ways like, what you day if you know you're gonna be dealing with emails, you're dealing with someone not turning out to work, something's not right, I get sent a menu, something's not right on this front. So you always constantly, there's always something going on. But I love it and I, I wouldn't really want to change it. Yeah. But I mean, I need to kind of take a step back a little bit, a bit more because it's kind of like the brand and the business to kind of grow. You need to be doing more outside events, mm. do more things like this, for example. Mm. So, um, yeah. Well, I, I'm yeah. going to come back to that a little bit and, and the challenges of running it now. But before we do, I just want to understand or help people understand you're doing 13, 14 hour a day straight. You're working 18 hours a day. You're not seeing the daylight. Why would you do that? What on earth were you getting out of it? That Because you enjoyed your time there. You say it's the yeah. best times of your life. Why do you love it so much that that kind of sacrifice is worth it? Is it, is it, is it the skills that you're learning? Or? Um, you're going into the kitchen and you first of all, you've got to prove yourself in that kitchen. It took me about four months to prove myself. I used to get abused every day by chefs. Shouted at, sworn at, pushed shoved and and I'm not a person to kind of give up and quit and I believed in my craft and my skill but it took me a lot of time to really kind of understand the library philosophy and seeing as I did you're in this family now and this is your family that you see 18 hours a day that become your best mates you see more than your girlfriend everything else and it was just a hunger that every single chef had there. I don't think there was a kitchen who was pushing what we were doing. At that time, back then, we went from rising one, from one star to rising one to two star, I think it was basically two years and got his start at Harvard. And it was just, a, you were battling against Brett. So for example, imagine this, you're in service and you've been running all day long and service kicks off at six o'clock and you're ready at five. Brett's like, okay, how can I push you a bit more? So we're going to the fridge, look around the fridge. Okay, James, we're gonna put on fresh pasta now with truffles, blah, blah, blah. Because he's always trying to see how, he's always, the great thing about Brett was he could get the best out of every single chef. So push you a little bit more, push a little bit more. He, that, his philosophy was nothing's impossible, nothing's impossible. And I had that with my way now that nothing's impossible. And you get through day and day and it only makes you a stronger chef. And that's how it did, it only made a stronger shift. And it was just, 
good bands and good farmers as soon as he came to service time and yeah, it was B. He put more responsibility, I think at the age of 25, 24, I think I was on the pass running with Brett. And it was just, and like, look back at that, at that age, it was just amazing. But you don't see that at the time and everyone's on back of each other, everyone's trying to push each other. And it was just a great place to be. And there were days when you had bad days, days when you didn't want to be there because you get up at three o'clock in the morning and, and fish would arrive at one o'clock in the morning and I had to finish, I had to fill it 60 mackerel. My hands stink of fish, I wake up, my hands are stinking, you know what mackerel are you fill it? Stinking it, getting up, falling asleep on the tube, missing a stop, getting to work. As soon as you're in there, it's like, you're up again. You're driving, you're pushing, and you're literally you're just running on adrenaline, running on adrenaline, running on adrenaline. I remember times where I would get on the bus, the 148 from Notting Hill to, to Camberwell. I'd wake back up in Shepherd's Bush. I would go all the way back around, wake up. Then I'd get off of the, and then the tube back open. I'd get on the tube, wake up in Stratford, way back up in Acton. It, it was, I think it took me some of, the, some of the six hours to get home. So I got home at nine or 10 o'clock, had to have two hours sleep to come back into work. And I mean, I, I couldn't do that now. No. I, I wouldn't want to do that now. And that kind of culture, I suppose, it, it put off, I don't know, hopefully not a generation, but it became terrifying for, I think, for some people to bring them into the industry. And we, we started to get a bad <coughs> reputation for the hours and for, yeah. the, for the abuse a little bit. Are there still people coming in at that level? Because like you say, although it was hard and, and uh, you know, I don't know, you're challenging in so many ways, you also loved it and you learned so much and you got so much out of it. It seems a shame if the culture in the kitchen, it's, it's, a, it's a fine line, I suppose, isn't it? Because that's a, it's a negative culture in the fact that nobody should have to work, you know, yeah. 18 days without seeing the sunshine. Uh, yet the flip side is if, if you're buzzing and it's developing, you're getting a lot out of it. What do you think the situation is now? Do you think the cultures well, in kitchens are changing? The or? culture in kitchen has changed so dramatically. It is a sad state of affairs. Basically, it used to be back in the day where, okay, I'm gonna go and work for Marcus Ware, I'm gonna work for Jason Stamps, I'm gonna work for Gordon Ramsay, and I'm gonna put two years in there. I'm gonna get shouted at, blah, blah, blah. But I'm gonna put two years there now. Earn your stripes. Yeah. Now, all they care about is money. People of this day and age care about the money more than care about having to do the experience. And somehow I can understand that. If you look at the cost of living goes up in London every year, Cost of living, cost of everything goes up. So the, so the money is important, but nobody really cares about having to put the solid hours in the graft in, we're getting showered at. It's become like, it's like, it's like someone's like, chef is kind of like a, a fashionable thing these days. And if you look in London, there may be, just sort of hypothetically, hypothetically it could be 20,000 chefs. I'm well, pretty guaranteed it's probably a thousand of them are good. Of 9,000 of them were just... Yeah, probably 30,000 jobs. So. And, and, probably, probably, probably not, and, probably, and rest of them, probably on 30,000, they probably can't even fill a fish mm. or break down a chicken because it all comes in prep now. All that, like, a massive trade has been missed. But what do you do? If there's every week there's a restaurant opening up, where the fuck do you get these chefs from? Yeah. Where are you getting them from? Because yeah. I don't know. No, it's, we, it's, Let me tell you this. I have, I've gone from four chefs in November down to two chefs. And in the space of next week, it's just me. <laughs> because chefs, I've had probably lined up seven interviews. Yeah, how many, how many people I've turned up? i had a guy told me this week he's gonna come every day. How yeah. did he turn up once? <laughs> I just like, why waste my time? Yeah. But here's the thing, like, you always get through it, as you know, you always get through it. Mm. I'm not stressed about it, I'm no, chilled no, no, about no. it. I'm, but, I'm, like, but yeah. like, we'll build a team again, it's fine, but it's getting the right people. I don't know if someone, what's the point of me getting someone in who's gonna be going in three weeks time, getting a month's time? I can just reduce, I've got, I've got chefs out there that are gonna come help anyway, so it's fine. But you have to get the right team. And then also protect that team as well. Like for me, the philosophy here is that everyone has input in the menu. First of all, it takes the pressure off myself. First of all, it's integral for them to feel when there's a dish going out that that's part of them as well. So that's the kind of philosophy here, but yeah, it, there is a massive chunk missing in industry by people putting in that graft. And you speak to every single restaurant. How's it been going, staff problems? 
It's always staff issues. Yeah. And it kind of grated on me at the beginning when we first opened. But now, like, it's just a custom. It's normal. It's normality. It is, unfortunate. Chefs like James, like, James, you've got no chefs. You're going to have no chefs. Don't worry, mate. I've got people pulling in, like, are you not bothered? Like, there's yeah. no yeah, point. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. As long as I can keep my, as long as I keep my food to the best that I can do my ability, and most important thing, happiness. And also as well as like, a chef that come work here, I bent over backwards for them. They, they work four days on, three days off. Nice. Yeah. And and they're learning. And and they and and I'm flexible. Here this, if a chef, my chef tomorrow doesn't turn up to work, goes on one tonight. I'm not going to sack him. <laughs> yeah. you don't let him listen to this podcast. Though, I might see that as an attentive, although luckily, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. the, the, the yeah. hypothetical future chefs. Okay, um, going back though, so at the time, you um, Brett also got the uh, Harvard oh, Arms, wasn't it? Yeah. So you went over there. Was that very different to the Ledbury? Yeah, it was that same retirement. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah was, Is that was, why he let you release? Did you have to do five years before he'd say... Yeah, it was uh, a good life. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was just lovely. Why? Pressure was just taken away. That pressure of constants and every day. But then I had that still in my mind and it and was that was that to just oh, sorry, because of the type of food or the or the number of covers or the kitchen brigade was only four. The head chef was very relaxed, but we but the the, the breed of chefs all had that standard. And it was enjoyable kitchen where you laugh, you joked. There was daylight, we were upstairs in the restaurant. It was just a nice environment to be in. I mean, not saying that Lebry wasn't, but it was just like you kind of recharge your batteries, you had a bit more of a life. And it was really enjoyable. And, and after, I think, six months, I was the sous chef there. And I, I enjoyed my time there. I was able to create a lot of dishes on there. It was good because it was good for Brett because he knew where I came from. And we had a, we had a good, like, friendship relationship. So yeah, it was just a, it was a lovely time, and uh, I think I ended up doing three or four years. Yeah. I think so. Why did you leave? Uh, it was time for me to do my own thing. I was kind of like the pop-up scene had come out. I was doing pop-ups at Camberwell, still working at Harwood Arms, and I just wanted really to kind of showcase my food. But I was literally just uh, a Harwood Arms 2.0. I would, and Lebri, I was just doing exactly what I learned from there, taking components and doing things there. Nothing was stem for roots. So it was just, I kind of done that food, kind of got a nice following, but that food wasn't who I was. Mm. And I think it's important for every chef to, uh, let's just say this, people are so interested in food these days, aren't they? They love to know where food comes from. Uh, where it's sourced from the chef to whoever. And I think it's integral if, if you can kind of tell a story about that and get the customer engaged, then you're already winning in some kind of ways. Mm. So I was like, hey, well, I need to really kind of understand my roots a bit more. So you look at Scotland, you think of mussels, razor clams, langstines, Douglas fir, venison, whiskey, oats, salmon, cullen skink. So it's kind of really kind of like, okay, let's kind of look at those flavors and try and put a different spin on those, on those interpretations of those classics or bringing those flavors into it and telling a story of when I had my first muscle experience or first time I had whiskey or my dad used to drink Johnny Walker's every day when he came home from work. So it's interpreting things like that. And then from my mum's side, it's those plantains, the coconuts, the pineapples, to your jerk spices, your scotch bonnet jams and bringing those influences and not really merging together but having an ident identity in that dish that I can kind of tell a story behind it with and I feel so much more happy in myself as a chef. Mm. I feel more honest every day of the food that I do and with both my parents passed away I'm still carrying on those kind of their legacy in some kind of way. So yeah, nice, the sort of authenticity and integrity yeah, of the story. Yeah. And I'm going to carry on doing that as you kind of see the Scotch bonnet jam now. I mean, I maybe talk about later. We, I'm not too will. sure, yep. but our Scotch bonnet jam. We have a factory producing that now. 
So we're getting that out there. As you know, that's the West Indian kind of roots. We've got our own jerk stout we've done. We've got our own uh, coconut and pineapple pills. Now. So you know that kind of that bit's coming from there. I don't really know, but I must go inside what I can kind of bring to the table on that one. Maybe I have my own whiskey, so I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe producing a whiskey in a rum cask could be just a possible thing. It literally came from a, uh, a podcast this morning where I was chatting to somebody about the, uh, the sort of future of English whiskey. So where there's been a lot of a huge growth in uh, craft gin and lots of gin distillers, partly because of the change in the, uh, in the sort of legislation around yeah. licensing so that you could set these new distilleries up. But off the back of that, obviously gin's really fast. Whiskey's a minimum of three years, but there's now all these gin distillers who've, who've got some longevity, seen as a market, who can now move into whiskey. So quite possibly, you know, that's the next sort of big thing is going to be uh, yeah. you know, a selection of craft English whiskeys um, yeah. to sit alongside the Scottish. So it'll be quite interesting. Um, going into the pop-up scene, was the, was the interest in that? Because talking about that opportunity to, um, to suppose, like, try some different food and to learn what that was about, was it easy to do in the pop-up scene because you don't have the full commitment of a restaurant and the expense is that what lured you to that oh, side of it? It was, it was amazing. Imagine if you had your four best mates working with you, one's doing the front of house, one's looking after the bookings, one's like two of them in the kitchen with you, and we're coming out and juicing all the dishes. You've got your friends, you've got your family there, you've got new customers coming in. You take over a pub on a Monday, Tuesday, we know they're dead. So now I'm out of this pub now, it's got 100 covers in two days and a couple of buy a table of two are buying a bottle of wine money in their pocket paying no rent on it where do the customers come from how do you take an empty pub and make it a full pub on pop-up night where, where, um, how are you marketing how are we marketing good question probably through like Facebook back in the day through friends like some of my work colleagues they worked in media or like football and hospitality Oh yeah, my friend's got pop up. It was kind of word of mouth is the best way you know of publicity. Yeah. And I guess if you've got a, le- a library kind of quality chef who all yeah. of a sudden is doing food for eight quid down at the local pub on a yeah. Monday night, you're going to think so we're doing I'm like getting eight, a bargain. Yeah, it's a ten course tasting menu for like forty five pounds. Yeah, meat and Dutch and cocktail. It, it, it was just like you're free. It was a free and easy deal once a month. And I just thought, okay, I'll try and do this on my own. And I just failed miserably because, as you know, many creative people are not very good at business. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that. Do you think that's why you started to learn a bit of the business acumen? Because it's, it's quite a common story of a chef going from the kitchen to setting up a restaurant and that not always ending uh, particularly well. To be fair, it's common for anybody setting up a restaurant, not just a chef, but chefs have got the, you know, got the ability from a kitchen perspective, but quite often doesn't translate. Was that pop-up time useful in starting to understand how business works? No. Or, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were just having a good time. Just just having fun. That, yeah. that, that came later. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, well, it's so it's, true. I think, I think a lot of creative people don't have that good business mind on their head. And um, luckily, I have a business partner that does have a good business head. And yeah, that's what you may, I mean, made so many mistakes through, through my life with many things I've done. But in some ways, you just you learn from that and it makes you stronger yeah. as a person. And well, uh, more business savvy. I want to touch on one because you end up at um, James Cochran EC3. Yeah, yeah. Which you're not there long. You leave, but you don't take your name with you. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but don't get me sued. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's so let's how, let's pave this story. So I had a place called Fix over in Morning Lane with my best friend. Never going to friend, never going to business with friends. That old, that old saying. Failed miserably because we were just had no clue about anything. And uh, I was getting phone calls on the phone. I think it was supplies chasing me up, ignoring me. Fortunately, my phone went off in my pocket. Picked up. Jesus Christ, you're hard to get in touch with. So like, who's this? It's like Alexi. I was like, oh. It was like I'm opening a place up in Soho. Would you like to be involved in it? I'm just like, wow, this is too good to be true. Yeah. Call it BYC featuring James Cochran, amazing, amazing, amazing. No one knew about me back then. So in some ways, I thank them in some kind of way because they got the PR company in and, and PR team in and people got to know about me more and more. We did the pop-up at six months, I think, in Soho before we got the permanent space in, in the city. Um, and again, like you look back in so many naive things I did through it all. Like, imagine this for you: someone's calls it James. Co- someone calls it after your, your name after your restaurant. Anything you want in the kitchen? 
just sounds amazing, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Ideal, coming yeah, from when you close they're, a restaurant, they're bankrolling it. You yeah. close a restaurant, um, and then you got like a little shareholder in it. <laughs> Again, it's on a contract, silly me. Um, and it was beautiful. And we opened a restaurant, and they were happy doing seven grand a week, and we're doing twenty-five grand a week. So they were literally laughing. And um, and through that, and through like kind of got a great review for Faye Mashler. There was a bit of buzz around me. Um, at the Great British Menu. So again, thank very, I thank them for that. Um, and at this time, I was kind of like, okay, do Great British Menu, I want to kind of leave here, do my own thing. So I went to a couple of houses. I went to look, it was like, they trademarked my name back in December, must be 2017, I believe it would be, 2017. 2017. So when I went to Great British Menu in the heats, was filmed back in December, and I won London South East. Ooh. <laughs> Might be a good idea to trademark it. Um, and it was a tough situation. And it was interesting, I guess, for a lawyer firm was ringing me up. It's an interesting story because someone's basically <laughs> got your name and trading under you. But the power of social media and the, the support that I got from everybody, it was lovely and warming because it's hard to think when you can't use your name anymore. It's, it's an exceptionally unusual situation, isn't it? I do think, um, you know, you're known for it now, aren't you? It has, it has definitely helped, yeah. along with Great British Menu. Yeah. The girl I was chatting to earlier, and I said, oh, I'm off to see James Cockburn, and I said Great British Menu, and then I mentioned the other uh, fact that you couldn't use your name anymore. Oh, yeah, 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 I know him. And I was like, yeah. wow, the power, the number yeah. of people yeah. that, that know you. I think I was trending. Man with no name. You're like Prince, aren't you? you know, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, I'll take that one. Yeah. I, think it, I think it got to a point where I was trending on Twitter. Yeah. And then I think Jay would have got involved, I think. I think like a couple of big people got involved in it. And then I think people sort of changed their Twitter names to not the real James Cochran. <laughs> and I, I thank you guys, thank you very much for that. And yeah. again, social media works in plus size and neg plus in good ways and negative ways. And it works in a wonderful way. And and inevitably over the course of months it closed down and uh, and and I they still want my name but I use my name as much as I want and okay. at the end of the day no one can take your name away from you. You are some still kind of called uh, James Cochran at the end of the day. Yeah, I think, yeah, aren't you? yeah. Um, Jay or, or Jay Cochran. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or Jimmy Cochran. Or Cochran underscore yeah, J.A. Exactly. The, real, <laughs> the real James. Yeah. Yeah. Um, funny enough, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, Jonathan Downey, JD from Street Feast, was one of the guys that I interviewed, and that was his uh, initial career. He was a, a lawyer, basically. Oh, wow. One of the things, one of his key bits of advice that he was giving people, because I guess, I'll well, we'll chat to you about that in a second, actually, but the idea of these kind of uh, street food places are incubators. But one of the key bits of advice he gave was, uh, yeah, trademark your name early on, trademark your name, not necessarily your own name, but the name of your business. Yeah. And it's something that all too often people forget or, or just you know why would it spring into your mind basically yeah. but I guess if you're talking to other young kids and stuff coming up into the industry you'd advise them yeah get the, get the legal yeah, sign up uh, early is that the uh, first of all is that the learning? first of all make sure the investor's on the same wave, wavelength as you are he understands your philosophy understands the vision of where you want to go if it's going to be named after yourself make sure you trademark it before you even open the business um, and always I just have to trust in your investor, your business partner, um, of where the direction of where you want to go. Um, and you're both understanding and the vision of where you want to be in a few years time and make sure that you have a nice share in the business because at the end of the day, if you're making money from an investor, you want to make sure you put money in your own pocket at the end of the day because in any business, you're there to make money, aren't you? And yeah, don't make the stupid yeah. mistake. <laughs> don't, don't make the naive mistakes that I've made. But always, I always call it character building. And, yeah, well, there's and that famous stronger. yeah famous phrase: you can't join the dots looking forward. You can only join the dots looking back, isn't it? And you, you've you've dealt with it positively. Um, there's been a bit of banter around it. There's even a poster I noticed downstairs that mentions it yeah. on your wall. And, uh, and and as a result, you've got twelve fifty one. So congratulations, because it, it, it suppose it's led you to creating something pretty awesome that yeah. you must you must be excited about. Yeah, 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 I mean, and. and I feel like me and my business partner were only kind of really 10% or 15% of where we'd want to be, really. Yeah, good. With it. Um, we still have a massive vision and massive direction of where we want to go with it. So, uh, yeah, a lot of exciting times for a lot, a lot of exciting times 
for the head of us, basically. Head, yeah. um, Mark Hicks was somebody else that I interviewed, and, and I asked him about uh, what advice would he give to people opening a restaurant. And his advice, even though I asked him three times, was, was don't. At the moment, he said it's the hardest he's seen it in his whole career. So he, he thinks back to 2008, sort of post-financial uh, sort of, you know, uh, collapse and all that kind of stuff. Uh, how long have you been open here now, and, and what's your take Coming on it? Coming up for two years. Two um, years? Great. So, yeah, how's, how has the industry, I suppose? There's been a lot of publicity about yeah. the casual dining sector, shall we call it, and, and the chains and the collapse of those. How is it as an independent in London? Um, I mean, touch wood, we're, we're finally established now. So we don't have to worry too much about our footfall. I mean, you're always worrying, of course, all the, all the time. That's apart from take, sleepless nights. Yeah. Apart from <laughs> sleepless nights, yeah. Um, I think I'm, I am quite concerned about this year. Yeah. I think we're going to see a lot of restaurants closing down. I think the street food scene is killing the casual dining trade at lunch, mm -hmm. for sure. And I call with it completely. I think if you can go out and spend £10 at a street food place, you're guaranteed to get amazing food. But the street food scene is becoming absolutely saturated as hell. The whole scene is saturated. And I would advise people not to I would, I, I would honestly look at moving outside of London. Mm. I think if you look at a Michelin guy that came out last year, this, and just generally food outside of London, there's so many great places to eat. Lower rent costs. I mean, I said to myself when I came to London, I would only do two years in London, go back home, never open a restaurant in London. Open a restaurant and failed. <laughs> Got my name taken away from me. <laughs> um, third time lucky? Yeah, yeah, so third time lucky in some kind of ways. But, I think you've got to be aware of the next, you've got, to, you've got to be up with the new trends. You've got to be looking at where the next kind of spot of the best, rest, like the next spot of area where the restaurant's going to be opening. Elephant Castle could be a great place, a lot of housing going up around there. Rent, zone two is, I think zone two now is not far as zone one rent, you know, these days, you know? Um, it's a difficult one, like, if you're going into it, you've got to be something unique and you've got to have a tell a story and it's got to be something personal to yourself. Yeah. I think it's integral and niche is hard to be because, I mean, I do small plates. <laughs> There's probably 2,000 restaurants that are doing small plates. But I, I am quite concerned for restaurants this year, this year. I mean, it's just outrageous the amount of restaurants that are opening. It's too saturated. It is. I agree, yeah. I'm not doing that. I think, I'm not I think we need, think we need uh, to, like, there needs to be problem. some system of capping, yeah. I, yeah. capping the amount of restaurants. <laughs> yeah. Because I, you've got these independent restaurants and, and these people invest in their bloody livelihoods in it. Yeah. And they're going down and losing money. Is the collapse of some of the big names, the big chains, thinking Jamie's, Carluccio's, Byron, not necessarily the collapse, but the, you know, the, the, uh, either the collapse or the reducing, yeah. is that going to help? I think the reason. Those businesses, I think they've opened up too many too quickly, 100%. But I think what we're seeing is the interest in people in food who are going a little extra mile to get something more than a Jamie's Italian or a Coluccio's and, and find a little picket holes in this or around the whole London that do very authentic food. So people are going a little extra mile now to find decent places. And I'm hoping that your Prezzo's and your Ask's and your pizza, pizza? Express. Yes, <laughs> are gonna fizzle out. And I think with that, what will happen is the premium will drop down and allow it for more small restaurant groups to come in and flourish off that. Mm. That's, what I, that's what I think. And me too, the one, I, mean, one of the, you know, I was gonna say, so the key thing I say with this podcast and, and the reason for starting it is you know, where you spend your money uh, has an impact on the kind of world we're gonna live in. So yeah. all we need is for people to choose to spend their money in the little guys and not in the big guys. And it, and it, you know, it leads to sea change, really, isn't yeah. it? So that's the objective, but. I mean, like I, I say this now, in any business, you, you're never comfortable. You always got to worry. I mean, I don't know, we could be closed in a year's time. You just don't know, do you? You do not. Like the, there's a, such a high turnover on Angel is, I think along this road, they call it Supper Street. So based Supper Street, they call it Supper Street. I think we have something over a hundred eateries, pubs, cafes along this road. So you can understand the amount of competition you have. But luckily we, we 
we've done well so far. Yeah. And you never know, like, you never know, like, it, it, we may have to relocate. Yeah, absolutely. You just don't know, like, you, yeah. like we haven't failed at all. We just may relocate to go to yeah. somewhere, somewhere cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the street the street food scene is really interesting, isn't it? Because I, I absolutely get why the consumer loves it because yeah, you know, yeah le less than a tenner. It's, it was interesting when uh, you know when street food was street food, i.e., you had to eat it on the street. There was still space for the restaurants. I, I think I've interviewed JD. I interviewed uh, Andrea Resca from uh, Mercato Metropolitano, and uh, oh, really, yeah, and, and these kind of places. If you've got any questions, shout. Um, but the, these kind of places that curate the space, I suppose. Um, are interesting because people still want to be able to sit somewhere. They still want to get a drink. They still want to spend maybe an evening out. Um, so they are filling that niche. But yeah, I, I worry where's the base point? Because we went from you know a point where yeah there was fine dining restaurants and, and people used to go out maybe once every three months. And then we got to the point with my parents where maybe it was like you know once a month. And now we go out maybe twice a day. But you get down to the point where food's only sort of you know three or four quid. And all of a sudden, yeah, yeah who's going to survive in that market? I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Um, I. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see how the street food scene will. I think. I think. It, I think it'll be consistent. I think. It, I think it's got legs to stand on. You know. No, I agree. I, 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 think, I, it get it. Yeah, I, I think it will. I think if you look at every year that your, your pockets are getting tighter and tighter. Mm. I think this fine dining thing is fading out. Fine dining thing, I think, is is a bit last year or yep. a bit yeah, 2010. Yeah. You can go out and get good food now at 12:51. <laughs> at many other restaurants, uh, Cornerstone, Trullo, so many restaurants I can carry on. And you don't have to break your, uh, don't have to, you don't have to rinse your pockets with money. So I don't have all the answers for this, but I'm just very interested to see how this year will pay for the next few years of restaurants. Yeah. And will some chefs just think, Do you know what, I'm done with London. I'm going to go to somewhere like Brighton, Bournemouth, yep. down the southwest coast, southeast. We could do with some chefs. So if you Ken. send a chef, we'll have to open restaurants, but send some chefs down, yeah. that'd be brilliant. <laughs> yeah, man, and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, exactly, yeah. Um, and maybe, like, I, you never know. I, I could just say, you know what? You know what, Mark? I'm done with this constant struggle of just chef stress. May just go and find a pub in the countryside low rent you never you just never know yeah and just have a pub and just just enjoy it a bit more and enjoy take some of my years back basically you know, i just don't know no. Mark, no, how, no, how it'll be for the future yeah but at this present moment we're surviving good <laughs> excellent yeah and and i'm happy yeah that's the most important thing that is the most important yeah, thing yeah. and you're doing it and you, you know you're, you're proud of having done it so so i guess um you know back to all the uh you know the positive stuff things like the great british menu um Positive impact in the fact that, you know, does, does that help you from getting covers into the restaurant? Is that still spoken about, do you think? Does it stay relevant for a period of time? For me, I'm like, that can go away now in some kind of ways. Yeah. Um, but that has yeah. been a massive platform for me and for our customer base. It's come to 12.51. Um, I cannot thank it a lot. I'm doing little pockets here and there. Um, looking at, trying to look at how my TV show. Yeah. Um, I think if you look at uh, how many black chefs do you see on TV at the moment, none. Um, I find the Ainsley. the cooking shows very middle class. Yeah, I want to try and bring something a little bit more fun, uh, a bit more fun, a bit more accessible, a bit more affordable. Um, that's really kind of my vision for 2020. So I'm looking. I'm just about to sign a contract for new a new agent at the moment. So. Just trying to push Scotch Bonnet Jam out there more and more. That was my next question. You've got a Kickstarter campaign running at the moment, yeah. is that right? So just tell me about that. So we're looking to drop it, I think, tomorrow. Or it's just, we're about to like do a lot of PR, kind of push on it. Yeah. Um, looking for just some more funds for Scotch Bonnet Jam to kind of push it out there more and more. Yeah. Um, the whole vision for it really, to be honest with you, is to get it into national everywhere. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, that would be my proudest moment. Yeah, amazing. I mean, something that stemmed from my roots, from my mum, yeah. to now being out, and it's... What's, spe it's, what's special about it? Um, Scotch Bonnie's thing gonna blow your head off, didn't they? Yeah. So, what I do is, I take tomatoes, red chilli, Scotch Bonnets, and I just burn the hell out of them. So completely black, brings that kind of a nice, kind of natural 
sweetness and caramelization from the chilies, if that does make sense. Um, and I won't say any more on it because I'm not going to give you my recipe. Yeah. But it's it's a nice balance of warmth, like warmth, spice, that kind of barbecue taste, acidity, sweetness, and it's just a all round lovely thing. And I think what happens when I did a great British menu dish and had the scotch bonnet jam as the compliment for it and people were having, so I was doing five different six cuts of goat. What was your favorite thing on it? The scotch bonnet jam. I was like, Jesus Christ, it's literally <laughs> gone away in a stove here, cooking away for hours, yeah. if you say that. So we were like, okay, let's do this. We have a factory now producing it. We now got onto a couple of a company called Stores um, and working with a couple of brands, I'm not gonna say anything, to do a kind of collaboration this year that's very exciting and really trying to push that out there to the masses and yeah. be one of my proudest things I do basically. Uh, and and I, yeah. I was gonna say, I think that's necessary, isn't it? We talked about the challenges of chefing and of restaurants just now. So you've really got to look at you know, every angle, haven't you? What, what yeah. do I know? How do I, how do I not just sell stuff through physical restaurants? Which yeah. We talked about the rent and they're expensive and having yeah, a brigade yeah. on site. But yeah, how can you get the stuff you know, making awesome produce yeah. and get it into people's hands through other yeah, retail, exactly. retail mediums? And well, we do, there's a couple, I don't know if you heard of Flight Club. Yeah. So we do two and a half thousand liters for them a month. Wow, amazing. Yeah, yeah. so. Uh, Lucky that you've outsourced the production of that. Yeah, because exactly. that'd be quite a lot in your kitchen downstairs, <laughs> isn't it? <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'd have a 24 hour chef basically doing yeah, your, it. Your eyes are watering just thinking yeah, about it. Um, and I think like with the brand clothing, that's just, that's, that's just brand awareness. Is it? I was Not, gonna ask about that. So what, yeah, what, you've got a clothing range? Yes. Is, it, is this for sale in other places or is this directly no, off the website? No, it's, it's just an online shop basically. Right. Um, and it's just really brand awareness, it's just a little bit of fun. My business partner's, um, business partner's wife, she, uh, she's a buy for top man, so she's basically just got a load of hoodies and, uh, okay. nice. and we've just got all prints on there and it's just a little bit of token. So we did Christmas, we gave them uh, some Scotch work jabs, some socks, and it's just a little bit of brand awareness, yeah, just nice. get the brand out more. And yeah. it's, it works, so it looks cool. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and it kind of fits myself, my business partner's kind of like ethos, hip hop, cool clothes, Scotch yeah. body jam, beers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and the beer bit is just um, game of what I live in Peckham, South London. There's a company called Brit Brewery from Peckham, and um, kind of collaborate on flavors. So for the winter time, uh, that we've kind of stopped because jerk stout is very niche. If you think about stout, jerk. But if you look at it in some kind of ways, jerk spices have them, pimento, all spices, cinnamon yeah, in. If you think of yeah, autumnal, yeah, you think autumnal. of those spices. So it was an acquired kind of taste, but we did kind of an easy drinking pilsner of coconut and pineapple flavors in it. And that sold out of that very quickly. Wow. You're still we doing that? Yeah, we are. We kind of got in. So, so basically, we could buy in kegs. Yeah. So if you want something, yeah, I was going to say no. It sounds yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah, we're big fans of. Uh, yeah. We're on the beach, so coconut and pineapple works yeah, well for amazing. us. Yeah, yeah so, over um, the ocean. Yeah. So yeah. So again, it's, we don't take anything from that. Right. We basically, so I ended up smoking all the hops. So I went back to Whitstable, went to the smokehouse, smoked all the hops wow. for our jerks that we did, not for this one. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I've, I've invested a lot of uh, time into, I think I saw like 200 kilos of hops. Oh, Of blimey. more grain actually. Really? Yeah, it was- That you smoked? I smoked them all myself. Wow. Yeah, and then I had my jerk spice, but we did it wrong because I left the garlic and the, um, I left the garlic and some other spice in it. So it reacted with, with, with producing a beer. So I had to bin it all and oh, start like, yeah. No, really? That hurts. <laughs> but again, it's, it's just brand awareness. You can buy it online. Yeah. Nice. Little things like that. And I think for 1251's vision, like moving forward, we would love to get a pub. I would love to have a pub. I would love to, we're going to kind of do goat in a coffin, we do go as kind of a pop-up. Yeah, so are you still doing that? Is it in Box Park at Croydon? No, we, we, no we, did, we did like a, a three, four month kind of pop-up there. Right. Um, and it was just, we were just a bit stupid of ourselves. We should have just helped, we should have, we were just kind of a bit greedy because we took Go on tour last summer. Yeah. And basically we did a few, we did like three festivals. We did Latitude, Black Key, Wilderness with Go and uh, got great feedback on it. And we yeah. did really well considering for Go. Sounds like a good niche. So we are just kind of carrying on that bandwagon wave and we kind of went for the first place of Brixton and we did a format pop there. Didn't do well because like I said, no, yeah, in Croydon, sorry. 
And so we want to put it into London, yeah. but we might just take over a pub or like do like a little residency, we go there where they take a percentage, we take a percentage, there's no real kind of overhead cost. Yeah. And let it be a slow burner and just yeah. let it, just see how it ticks over. Preferably South London would be a good place to do it. Yeah. Um, and see how that kind of goes with that. Um, and that's it, like I don't, I don't want to wear myself too thin. I was going to say, that was is exactly the question I've got. How do you find that balance between needing to do all of that, to keep awareness and keep people interested and that need to diversify? And we've found the same, you know, for the last couple of years. Uh, but also, you know, the, the, the bit, I guess, that generates the most return at the moment is bums on seats in 1251 yeah. and people coming in for lunch and dinner. Yeah. yeah, how do you find that balance? And have you got the support around you to, uh, to help with that? <laughs> right, I did I did I did have the support. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like I have the support through my business partner and I have, I think, some like six events next month. Right. Edinburgh, Whitstable, got two in London. So I'm keeping busy. Yeah. It's just uh, the most important thing is always 1251. Yeah. The most important thing, bums on seats, the most important thing. But once I said, once you get that team into play, that will never see happen then everything I'm doing outside of here is just bringing more, it's the brand awareness, yeah. people know about my name, and bringing more money, fingers crossed, into the business. So it does make sense, but you, you have to do everything step by step and not burn yourself out and not, and not dilute the brand or thin the brand out, if you know what I mean. So I do. we'll do everything properly and right, and we're learning from mistakes, like I said, for yeah, doing yeah. the GOAT from last year. So yeah. it's all things that you learn, and you, you learn over the course of the months, course of years and you just take on that and hope to not do it again. Yeah, 100%. So, uh, nice vibe. I walked in here um, after lunch, but I came in, the music was on. It's a cool little uh, venue. I had some, yeah, you know, just just a good... You, uh, hospitality is about how places feel, I think. Yeah. As soon as I walked in the door, you go, yeah, cool, I like this, you know, it feels good. Yeah, yeah. And I, and, and I think only the independents really bring that. You don't get that when you walk into a, no. into a chain. So if you're describing this place to listeners, and, uh, you know, it'd be great, obviously, if they come down yeah. and get some lunch or dinner. Um, you know, who, 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 does, who does it appeal to? Who's your... Um, Ideal kind of customer. What are demogra well, demographics from 12 year olds to 96 year olds? Yeah. Also 106 year olds. Um, basically, me and my business partner, we did this on a shoestring. We had something like £100,000 investment. I think 50, 54000 went of that for the premium i think 30 grand went for solicitors so we're left with 16 grand wow that's unbelievable yeah. so we just max out a load of credit cards yeah. and everything you see as me and my business partner have done it's a bit it's a bit rough around the edges but like if you go to downstairs area you've got all the vinyl on the back of the wall every bit of lighting every bit of fitting painted everything that we've done ourselves so it's very personal when you come in when you come in don't expect someone on grow rich when you're going to have white linen you won't no. What we want is when you come in, if your expectation is to be way below the floorboards, <laughs> but when you leave to be way above the skies. And that's how it is. And I've been to Mr. Star restaurants where I hate it, very stuffy. And I, what I've tried to do is to bring hip hop music with small plates that stem from my roots. Um, and the service is super relaxed. I don't even think we serve wine. I think we just put the wine on the table because I was like, when I go out to eat, I want to be with my partner, my friend, and just have wine, sit in the corner, be left alone. And, it's, and if you look at the reviews, you'll see that the service is probably on par or better with the food. And that's what I want. I want people not to shout about the food or people to shout about the service. And that's what you get. And it's super relaxed and it's a good vibe, a good place to be. And fingers crossed you're going to have good food. Yeah, amazing. No, it is. It's got, it's got a lovely uh, yeah. it's got a lovely vibe. What was it before? Was it a restaurant before? Yeah, it was a Chinese laundry. So it was a was Chinese it? restaurant before. Okay. And uh, you can see the floorboards still say the same. Yeah. And no, again, cool. and again like, I was saying to you, Mark, it's like, you know how it is with business. Once you get a bit of money in there, you know, you've got to be the tax man, you've got to pull the VAT or this. So a bit of money done there, we'll accessorize some more plants. Inevitably, one day we'll sound the floor. <laughs> It's just, never ending. Yeah, it's, it's, it's never just ending. like, or oh, there's, there's many repairs we've done in the kitchen, but 
we've had no complaints from our customers, so no, and, it's down to me. Yeah, My business yeah, yeah, partner yeah, yeah, yeah. just and wanting to make the place nicer. Kitchens are expensive. No, yeah. it's got it's got a lovely vibe. Yeah. So um, you do all sorts, as we've talked about, with your you know your, your jams and your uh, and your clothing and your chefing and all that kind of stuff. Um, you've been through you know good times, bad times. Yeah, you've yeah. got all of this knowledge. What bit now? You know, hospitality is an interesting industry, but but. Why do what gives you the greatest buzz, the greatest reward when you wake up on a whatever day of the week it is and you're excited um, to get out of bed and go to work? What is it that drives you and makes you happy? First of all, I don't see coming to work as work. Mm -hmm. um, it's my most, it's a very enjoyable place for me. It's where I can be most creative. Um, and it's my most happiest place to be. Like, I think for any person, if in any creative field, if you're creating something that you could put onto a play or onto a wall, or if it's music or art or anything, and you're watching that expression on the customer's face and putting a smile on their face and a warming feel, then for me, that's my most happiest thing. Um, for me, it's to put smiles on people's faces. And if I can carry on doing that, then I want a good thing. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And hospitality is good for that, isn't it? That instant kind of recognition. And I think we're, we're so lucky because you know, a lot of people have ideas that only ever stay in their heads. Or, the, or if, you know, if they do make something, they might make it at home in their lounge or yeah. something like that. But we get to think of things in our heads, turn it into a three-dimensional reality, and then the public actually come into us and give us feedback. Yeah. And it's quite a buzz, that, yeah. isn't it? Because most people don't get that opportunity to take something that's no. only in their mind and then make it a, yeah. a, something that people and, can and, visit. And so many people like are so scared about putting that one foot forward and having that dream of vision they may have had for so many years. But... I think this day and age, it's so easy accessible to do it on so many platforms, if it's social media, to anything, to blogging, to have your own website, to anything. So I think just, you've got to kind of give it that, give it a go and just see how it goes. And if it, if it flourishes or you have to understand you're going to be making so many mistakes for it all. You are. You'll be yeah. making so many mistakes, you know, days where it's not going to be going well, days where it'll be amazing. But it comes down to your happiness and as long as you've given it a go, that's one thing you could tick off your box. Yeah, a action always beats intention, doesn't it? I say it to a lot of people. Exactly, so many people yeah. think of doing stuff and don't do it, but just just start. And yeah. You work it out at the end of the day, as you've yeah. said. You know, things go well, things go bad, but you work it out. Yeah, and every yeah. day, if you can do it with exactly, a smile yeah. on your face, yeah. learning whilst you're having some fun, yeah. all the better. Um, well, some people I get an idea of kind of what's next and where they're going, but you've got so many things on. Do you end up back in Whitstable with your own little restaurant down there? Is that is that ever going to happen? Do you think? Do you think you'll be in London forever, or you know, um, where's, where's the future if you could uh, if you could guess it? My future for me would be to have this restaurant and to have a pub and to be working two, three days a week going into my kitchen. And then on the side of that, just be doing little events here and there. And I guess not a bad shout, probably I would, I would love to, I'm getting, I'm getting on now, but I mean, it may be in 10 years time, maybe to go back and have a small little place at Whitswell, just done full circle, done my London bit and gone back there. And, and then, done, done and then bring my family up along the seaside where I first started. They can start off at Wheelers again and be chefs and then run my restaurant. John, Living the job dream. done. <laughs> that, that's got to be a good place to uh, close it in your happy yeah, place, in yeah, your yeah. utopia. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So yeah. where do people go then? They want to find out more, in particular social channel or website. Where's the best place so, to go to follow your journey? Okay, so restaurant 107 Upper Street, 1251. Angel. Um, social platforms. Just 12, uh, 1251 Restaurant or Chef James Cochran on social platforms. Um, www.1251.co.uk. Job done. Check it out. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I will put some uh, links through to your uh, website and social as well Amazing. on our website. So humansofhospitality.co.uk. Um, we'll put it all on there. But look, thanks so much for sharing the time. Much. It's really, really good Thank to meet much. you. Good luck. I'm going to come and see you uh, in 10 years' time in Whitstable. We'll have a coffee. Amazing. Sounds, right. sounds, sounds great. Thanks so much. And a load of voices as well. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much for listening to this week's podcast. And remember that on the website, humansofhospitality.co.uk, every week we put on some uh, show notes and some links through to the various websites or social media that are mentioned. And we also do a nice little breakdown of that week's conversations into specific topics. So you can jump through the podcast and just listen to some of the highlights if you wish. If you've not done so already, if you could leave us a review on iTunes or one of the other podcast players of your choice that would be hugely appreciated thank you so much and uh, we'll be out with another episode next monday